this table summarizes the nutrition assessment for the respiratory system. So this is not just for COPD, it is for all pulmonary patients. Please go through this table and see if you can make a connection to the pathophysiology signs and symptoms of each disease. As for COPD is concerned, potential problems for the nutrition diagnosis could be increased energy expenditure. This is mainly due to the body's compensation effort to guide more air into the system that is already compromised. The respiratory muscles are working very hard in this case. Another reason why these patients have increased energy expenditure is that both emphysema and chronic bronchitis involve inflammation, and some individuals may have infection as well. Both of these factors could require more energy as needed. Because of the disease, many people have difficulty breathing, or they constantly feel fatigued. Therefore, their energy intake, oral intake, or intake of other nutrients are usually inadequate. So again, they're feeling too tired to eat and it's difficult to eat if you can't breathe well. Also, since these are chronic conditions, if the inadequate intake and energy continues to the point where we are deficient, eventually malnutrition will occur. To estimate energy and the nutrient needs for COD patients, usually we will take into consideration the increased energy expenditure. So this would be the range um, that we would use once we estimate the resting or the um, basic energy expenditure. Protein requirements are much higher for COPD than in healthy adults, which you know is the 0.8 gram per kilo. It could be as high as 1.7, uh, which is more than twice as much. If we're using predictive equation, studies have shown that Harris-Benedict equation has a tendency to significantly underestimate the energy needs Therefore, indirect calorimetry is the best way to go if we have it. But as we know, it's usually not available. So in that case, um, this would be the range that we want to use. We want to provide 25 to 30 calories per kilo. And keep in mind that we want 20% of the calories to be provided by protein. The goals for intervention for COB COPD patients include to maintain, restore, and optimize nutrient status through food, beverage, and if necessary, the use of supplements. We want to prevent continued weight loss, and even in overweight patients, the weight loss caused by COPD is not desired. A loss of lean mass is associated with higher mortality. When the lean mass reaches a loss of 40%, the mortality is 100%. Therefore, we really want to maintain the lean ma mass. And even better, if we can restore some of it, that would be great as well. We want to provide sufficient energy, but not excess energy, because in order to um, metabolize the micronutrients, we need to have the adequate adequate oxygen supply. And in the case of COPD, this is usually not the case. Therefore, we want to avoid overburdening the system. When we talk about overfeeding, we need to remember the magic number of five milligrams per kilo per minute. That's the maximum glucose infusion rate if the patient requires tube feeding but we definitely don't want to get close to this number because too much carb can increase carbon dioxide production and CO2 requires the lungs to breathe it out. 
Therefore, the more carbon dioxide, the more work for the lungs to carry out. We should focus on food and nutrient delivery looking at two fronts, both energy and protein. Because oral intake is low, we really want to increase the nutrient density. You know, really make every bite count. Very often we will have to coordinate care because these patients, although exercise can be beneficial, they really need physician clearance to exercise, exercise is tolerate, tolerated. And a lot of the exercises that they'll do, maybe they'll learn it in the pulmonary rehab that we discussed in the other section. Um, it can actually help them do movements that help them breathe. Nutrition support may become necessary, especially when we talk about respiratory failure which could result, could be the result of a COPD flare. When or, oral intake is inadequate among COPD patients, and when we do not expect the condition to improve anytime soon, then we should be considering enteral feeding. And of course, early initiation has been shown to be associated with certain benefits. Intensive care may be necessary for certain COPD patients. For those patients who are extremely sick, often they need intubation and mechanical ventilation. So in this case, we're talking about an acute flare in COPD leading to respiratory failure. And there is a section in this chapter about that organ failure condition. In this case, we'll really be needing to use enteral feeding unless it is counterindicated for some reason. Also, if the patient is still able to have a little bit of oral intake, that's fine, but we definitely wanna be ensuring adequate uh, nutrition delivery, and so we may, we'll likely have to use a combination of, of routes to deliver. So if they're having oral intake, that's fine, they can continue doing that, but we'll likely also want to supply them with enteral nutrition as well. Patients with multi, multiple system organ failure, again, respiratory failure could be one of the failures we see. So in this case, we have to use parenteral nutrition because a high metabolic stress could lead to GI disturbances, including stress ulcers. And of course, this may make tube feeding impossible or not appropriate at the moment. The commercial formulas to reduce the CO2 production usually have low carbohydrate content, but with high lipid content. So it's 30% versus 50%. With a low carb content in the tube feeding formula, CO2 production is decreased. But we also need to remember that our stomach needs a much longer time to process lipids. So if we're using the NG tube feed for feeding high lipid content formula, that will just delay gastric emptying. And of course, this could lead to bloating and also them feeling, having the early satiety. So this is something that we will need to consider. Depending on the patient's GI function, we can either choose a polymeric or a hydrolyzed formula. Overfeeding should be avoided, and this is because that overfeeding could increase CO2 production. So this is the level that we don't want to exceed. Remember, the recommended allowance for energy is 25 to 35 calories per kilo but we don't wanna go over 35 calories per kilo. The only time we may consider doing this is after measurement by indirect calimetry and we find that the patient needs more. Once we reach the estimated energy intake, uh, we should either be right at it or slightly below it. Again, we don't want to exceed it. And that's something we always need to be keeping in mind when dealing with respiratory patients. Although we have these formulas for pulmonary patients, we really don't want to use this for long-term or routine use. 
It's more that if they have a severe acute flare that's when we used. So again, just because somebody is coming in for respiratory failure or um, COPD, we don't automatically put them on the high fat, low carbohydrate formula. We need to take uh, other things into consideration. So we can use the evidence-based practice guidelines, which we can find within the academy. And also, in the case of respiratory failure, Aspen also has uh, good evidence-based guidelines that we can refer to.